What's up everybody? Welcome back to my channel, Richard on Data. If this is your first time here, my name is Richard and this is the channel where we talk about data, data science, statistics, and programming. Subscribe for all kinds of content just like this and hit the notification bell so YouTube notifies you whenever I upload a video. So, I have a confession to make to you guys. I really, really love Julia. I really do. So, she came into my life around this time last year and there's just this thing about her. She's really, really reliable. And sometimes I'll just be sitting here, I'm working on a data science project, and I ask her to do something, then she does it, and really, really fast at that. It's just, it's really amazing. And I'm talking, of course, about the Julia programming language. What did you think I was talking about? Last week I did a video on R versus Python, and I tried to break down how these two languages compare to each other as far as metrics like how easy are they to learn, their relative capabilities, and their popularity in the year 2020, just how things like that are concerned. But there's a lot of people talking about and asking questions about Julia, so I thought it would be appropriate to see how Julia compares to these other languages which have been around for a considerably longer amount of time. I'll be going over everything about Julia, but mainly focusing on comparing it to R and Python as a frame of reference, because I'm sure a lot of you watching this already have some degree of familiarity with either R or Python. Before I do that, some background on me. As I've talked about in some of my other videos, I have been an R programmer for over eight years. I actually picked Julia up for the first time around this time last year. And I did a couple data science projects using it, also some paid trainings, but I'm not an expert on it by any stretch of the imagination. So this video will be partially based on my own experiences, but also partially based on just what people out there tend to be saying about it. Julia was launched in the year 2012, and it was created by some absolutely brilliant mathematical minds. I'll list out all of them in the description of this video, but the main motivation behind creating Julia was to combine the ease of use and the overall utility, beautiful syntax, all that good stuff you get from Python with the performance and speed benefits that you get from a language like C. And like R and Python, it is an open source language with a ton of libraries libraries which are created specifically for data science. As far as size is concerned, just to give a bit of comparison between the three languages, Python has about 214,000 packages developed at the time I'm making this video, R has about 15,000, and Julia has about 3,000. Obviously, this is not a total apples to apples comparison because the focus of the three languages is totally different. Python is a general purpose programming language. R's main focus is on data analysis and statistics. Julia's focus is on scientific computing. Julia also has a pretty impressive number of downloads. At the time I'm recording this video, again, January of 2020, Julia has been downloaded some 12 million times. Though, as far as things like the Tyobi index are concerned, it does lag significantly behind R and Python at this time. So we can start by thinking of Julia the same way we do of R and Python. It's a full stack programming language, and the packages out there for it are designed to conquer your standard problems you run into in the data science world. So things like you start with your data, you need to clean and tidy it up, get it into a different format, then you need to create some kind of report or visualization or model. Right now the packages in Julia are equipped to do all of those things. Then from a computational standpoint, Julia is built to have multiple dispatch, asynchronous I.O., and it's compiled rather than interpreted. So the basic translation of all that is it's very flexible, the performance is really good, and the multiple dispatch aspect of Julia is huge because this basically means it's going to be flexible and you're not going to have some of the weird and erratic behaviors and errors which you could possibly see in a language like R or Python. As far as a user community is concerned, it's been my experience. The Julia community is super friendly, super helpful. Also, the Julia developers themselves have a lot of tutorials up on YouTube here as well. They're really well done, really professional, really helpful. 
However, the community is significantly smaller than the R or Python communities. That's just a function of it's 2020, Julia hasn't been around for as long. So if you're Googling or searching on Stack Overflow for the answer to a question, compared to R or Python, you are unfortunately a little less likely to find the answer to that question, at least right now. Then if you're wondering how easy it is to learn Julia, let me answer that question a couple different ways. If you already know Python, you will pick Julia up immediately. The syntax of Julia is incredibly similar to the Python syntax, so much so that half the time you might not even realize you're not coding in Python. Now if you don't know Python, and even if you're not familiar with any other programming languages, Julia is probably one of the absolute easiest that you can pick up. In fact, it's just as easy, if not even easier, than Python is. And that's just because the syntax for it is so clean and so simple. I don't necessarily recommend learning Julia as your first language, and it's just a popularity issue. I would learn SQL before any of them to get database fundamentals down, and then learn Python, just because Python could be the most popular programming language in the world in a couple years. But if you do learn Julia first, I don't think you'll have a bad time with it. And now we have to talk about what's probably Julia's biggest selling point, which is obviously speed. So Julia was built for speed and for runtime, and this is primarily because it was built for parallel computing. And granted, you can get this effect in Python, but it does require some upfront work because Python simply wasn't designed with parallel computing in mind. So Julia themselves report some pretty incredible speed comparable to something like C. So if you take a look at this micro benchmark comparison, again, this is put out by Julia themselves, but if you just look at the distribution of times that it takes to run various algorithms and code patterns, Julia is going pretty impressively fast. In fact, it goes significantly better than most things on this list. Go, Fortran, Java, JavaScript, MATLAB, Mathematica, Python, R, Octave. Julia is pretty much blowing all of them out of the water. Now you may be thinking, well, that's great, but Julia themselves are reporting that. What are other people saying? Well, most third parties, myself included, seem to be corroborating that statement. Julia is really fast, and in fact, it's faster than Python. Now this is an example from the Hacker Noon blog. Basically, they ran a sorting algorithm over 10 million randomly generated integers, and they compared the runtime that this takes between C, Python, and Julia. Now, the results are pretty interesting. This wasn't necessarily true for a small number of integers. In fact, in that case, Python was doing better. But at a high number of integers, Julia just destroys Python. It's significantly faster. However, there is one current caveat on Julia speed, and this is what's known as the time to first plot problem. So what this basically means is that the first time you execute a command, Julia might take a surprisingly long time to do it. Now this is because Julia is what's called a just-in-time compiled language, so it requires your packages to be compiled when you run some kind of process that requires them. So your current workaround to this is just to keep your session open for as long as you can. The first time you run something, it may take a long time, but every time after that, it'll be fast and you'll be in the clear. But obviously, there are some concerns about this, namely from a scalability perspective as well as just the perspective of sheer optics. However, this is something the Julia developers are aware of and are working on, so we'll just have to wait and see what happens. As far as data manipulation is concerned, Julia has what's called the data frames package, and this has all of your standard functionalities like reading data, filtering rows, selecting columns, joining, creating mutations, doing grouped summaries. You have all of these functionalities. It's very similar to something like pandas in Python. And in fact, I was pretty impressed with it. I thought the data frames package was really fast. I had no complaints whatsoever with it. Julia also has a lot of different visualization libraries. Probably the most popular option right now is just called Plots, and this package is equipped to be compatible with a variety of different backends. So for instance, if you want to make Python-style graphs, a common backend typically used is just the PyPlot backend. There's also a variety of extensions using the Plotly JavaScript API if you want to do fancier things like interactive plots. 
Now, if you're like me and you're a fan of the Grammar of Graphics framework and the ggplot2 package in R, there are some similar options for you in Julia. There's the Gadfly package and there's the Vega Light package, and these will operate through that same type of framework. Here's the thing though, these packages do not have anywhere near the level of maturity and sophistication that something like ggplot2 does. And to be fair to Julia, this is actually the same criticism that I have of Python's visualization libraries. But from my own experiences with Julia's plotting libraries, there's almost always been one little thing that I wanted to do, just to take my graph from good to perfect, and I haven't necessarily been able to figure out how to do it using Julia yet. Now granted, if you're not like me, you don't consider yourself very particular or very picky about graphs, you probably don't have to worry about it. Any kind of basic graph, you are going to be able to do using Julia. Now as far as interactivity is concerned, I've already mentioned that you can make interactive plots. They work quite nicely. As far as taking something like that to the next level and doing something like an interactive web app, we're looking at something closer to Shiny. And I mentioned in an earlier video, Shiny is one of my all-time favorite packages. And while the developers do have it on their roadmap, there's not currently an answer in Julia for interactive web apps that has anywhere near the level of reliability that something like our Shiny has. And again, to be fair to Julia, Python doesn't really have this either. I've mentioned in my last video, Python's Dash does not have anywhere near the sophistication and the ability to handle complex requirements that our Shiny does. As far as an integrated development environment is concerned, Julia has what's called Juno. That's probably the most popular option, and it's accessible through the Atom app. There's also the iJulia package, which just allows Julia to interface with Jupyter Notebooks the same way a lot of people write Python code. I talked about this in my R versus Python video, but I do like RStudio more than any of the above. I think Juno has a fairly similar design. I did like it, but it is clunkier and a little slower than something like RStudio is. And again, this is the same criticism that I have with Python. And again, I like R Markdown more than I like Jupyter Notebooks, but for your reporting requirements, you don't really have to worry. It's just a matter of personal preference. Jupyter Notebooks will get the job done. Now, lastly, if we think about modeling, there's a lot of different options out there for that. Starting with machine learning, Julia has its own implementation of the Scikit-Learn API, which works absolutely great. And in fact, if you want, another option out there is to use the PyCall function. This is just a function which calls Python code using Julia, and you can call the Python Scikit-Learn module. Both of these options, from my limited experience with them, worked absolutely great. As a full disclosure, I haven't done any statistical modeling or statistical tests using Julia yet, but there's a lot of different options out there. There's the stats models package, there's one called multivariate stats, there's one called distributions, and there's tons of other statistical libraries out there, which makes sense because Julia's focus is on scientific computing. Now again, I haven't actually used these myself. I've read commentary out there on them, and I haven't heard any complaints or really any major shortcomings with them. Now, as far as deep learning is concerned, Julia has essentially an official deep learning framework, and it's called Flux. Now, I have actually gotten the opportunity to play with this, not through an actual data science project, but through Julia's official paid training, and I was pretty impressed with how quick and easy the syntax is. Naturally, it's deep learning, so there's going to be a deep learning curve to it, but it's not horrible, and you can probably pick it up fairly quickly. Feedback on Flux appears to be pretty promising so far. There are some odd speed complaints that I've heard about it, but nothing that particularly raises any serious red flags. Overall, if you were to ask me in the year 2020, is Julia a major competitor to R and Python? I would have to say the answer is surprisingly nuanced. And I'm going to start actually by summarizing the biggest setbacks of Julia. And to me, the biggest one right now is the current lack of package maturity. Because it just happens to be the case, some packages right now have some bugs they need to work through. And if we take long-term, tried, trusted solutions, let's say for 
R for visualization. We have ggplot2. Julia just really can't live up to all of that right now. However, I don't actually think that it's totally fair to pit Julia against R and Python, which are languages which have been around for a much, much longer time. And in fact, I'd be incredibly surprised if Julia isn't a huge player in the data science scene in three to five short years. This really comes down to speed, which Julia was designed for from the ground up. Frankly, the amount of data which is generated every single day is absolutely mind-blowing. So the era of big data and just the requirements surrounding it, that's not going anywhere. So it's easy to scoff at Julia doing something faster than Python in the order of a few microseconds. But when you're dealing with billions and billions of records, those microseconds do add up. Honestly, today, if you're doing smaller and simpler analyses, I can't imagine you having a problem with Julia, and in fact, I think you'll be completely thrilled by it. I don't honestly think we're ready today for large-scale models which are put into production environments, but especially when we consider Julia's parallelism advantages, there is huge potential there. I don't recommend learning Julia as your first data science language. Again, I would know SQL before anything else. Then I would learn one of R or Python, master it, go back and know enough of the other one of those two languages to be dangerous. Then you should probably pick up Julia at some point. It's easy to learn and it's something that at the bare minimum it should be on your radar as we move into this decade. So thanks for watching this video. Leave a comment below and let me know if you've used Julia and if you have what your experience with it was. I'll see you guys in the not so distant future. Until then, Richard on data.